Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar. Um, this has been a long time in the making, so we really appreciate you guys taking the time to tune in. Uh, we are going to be offering these webinars monthly as an opportunity to spread financial education, answer some of those questions you're asking yourself every day. Um, we actually do have a chat where if you have questions throughout the presentation, please post there. Uh, if we have time at the end, we'll do a question and answer with our guest, Eric Brotman, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, if we don't get to your questions today, we're going to work to, or we'll review them. We'll work to have them in future presentations. Uh, like I said, we want this to be educational. Uh, we want you guys to be involved. We want to have fun doing it. So any input um, and just joining and listening in uh, is really well received, and we really do appreciate it. Um, I believe the best way to get started is introduce myself. So I will be your host, and my name is Cody Niedermeyer. Uh, I'm from Maryland. I actually got my undergrad degree in marketing from the business school at the University of Maryland. Uh, from there, I was able to get my master's in finance from the University of Baltimore, where I was actually introduced by a neighbor to our guest today, Eric, who uh, I don't know why, but he welcomes me into BFG with open arms. And that's how I got to where I am today. And without further ado, I think it's important to introduce Eric. So our guest today is Eric Brotman, who is the, fi the founder of BFG Financial Advisors. Uh, he's been in the industry for a very long time. I won't put a date on it, Eric, because I don't want to stir it up too much to start the presentation. By the end, I'm sure we'll be having some fun with it. Um, he's also the host of Don't Retire, Graduate, which is a podcast that he's been growing over the last two years. Uh, I believe he just finished up the second season and is starting the third. So if you like what you hear today, please subscribe to that. Uh, without further ado, I believe we have you on the line, Eric. Cody, it's good to be here. This is this is fun, and uh, you're a natural. I'm, I'm glad you're hosting this series for us. <laughs> yeah, I've never hosted one before, so uh, when we discussed it and you presented the opportunity, I jumped at it, and uh, we're going to see how it works out, especially doing it every month. Um, we're going to have you on a couple times. We have a couple of the other principals at our firm that are going to join, um, and I, I think it's going to be very well received by everyone and a resource that they're able to use which is a lot of what we're trying to give back this year especially with some of our goals we have at the marketing committee very good let's do it let's do it so the focus of today's broadcast or webinar is financial resolutions we figured it's january everybody loves to make new financial resolutions so we want to help you with making those decisions of what happened in 2020 and what you need to do in 2021 to be successful or take steps in accomplishing your goals and getting organized and uh, making good decisions. So to get started, to understand where we wanna go, I believe we gotta understand where we've been. So Eric, 2020 was one of the craziest years of my life. Um, I, I don't even know where to begin to describe it, but I think uh, the elephant in the room is COVID. What happened in 2020? How did it impact us financially? And where are we at now? Well, I, I certainly am not going to bring any, any, um, uh, and shed any light on the medical side of this, but certainly yep. from a financial standpoint, um, what COVID did was create an amazing divide between the haves and the have nots in not just the US, but around the world. Um, and we're experiencing what I believe is, for the first time, a K-shaped recovery. I mean, mm -hmm. markets, for the most part, uh, financial markets around the world have been incredibly resilient during this period of time. There was certainly some unknowns last March and April, but, but since that time, it's been a, a pretty uh, significant ascent. And so what's happening is people who are... Um, white collar and either self-employed or um, or working in a in an industry where they can work from home, um, it's been a disruption, but it's also been an opportunity. And a lot of these folks are doing better than ever. They're spending less money on things like travel and 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 entertainment and fun. So a lot of people are actually saving more money and building more wealth this year than normal, which is a bizarre sort of outcome from this. Um, the problem is that on the other side of that K, the downside of the K, we have a much larger swath of population that is now one check, one missed paycheck away from oblivion. Um, they're, they're needing the stimulus and the lifelines that are coming from the government, the extended unemployment, 
And the longer people are employed, the harder it is to eventually get a job. And so I, I think it's going to take a really long time to get back to whatever that sense of normal was. And rebuilding the middle class has never been more important. Yeah, uh, I know us as an organization dealing with COVID and the transition of being in the office and every day and having that camaraderie of, you know, seeing your coworkers, working with them, being able to pop into the room next to you to, you know, ask a quick question and, you know, just being in an environment that's more of a collaboration rather than you're looking over your shoulder and you're alone and then you look back at the computer and you find yourself on a Zoom or a webinar like this uh, was a transition that I think scared a lot of people um, and, and it resulted in the March and the Aprils on the decline, but then we were able to kind of figure out the ways to be more efficient and, you know, kind of deal with what we've been dealt. And as you said, the markets recovered in a way that was awesome to see the resiliency of it. Um, I mean, we're at highs right now, so I thought that was that was pretty interesting. But like you said, we're still in a response to what happened in 2020, and that kind of builds into, of course, it was an election year as well. So we had November come around. It was. We were going. I didn't hear anything about it. This oh, was an you election didn't have year. Any, uh, I thought you might have caught it on the news once or twice, but uh, we did actually have an election in November that uh, that definitely had an impact on 2020. And I think COVID building up to that made it one of the most anticipated elections we've ever had. So I guess to close out looking back on 2020, what did you see from the election? And I'm not asking you to take sides or anything like that, and I know you're going to remain neutral. Um, I think it's important to discuss, you know, the financial impact of that election once we were presented with COVID. You, you know, the election cycle itself, I'm so glad it's over just because the noise of it is so unpleasant. Um, what, what I would say is that there was a great deal of uncertainty that lingered well beyond election day. So had we gotten results on election day, that Tuesday in November, and had a, an mm -hmm. opportunity to plan in November and December around what we thought either tax policy or legislative policy or, or other things might be, it would have made this a little bit easier for us to not only take care of financial decisions, but to take care of planning decisions for, uh, for clients. So um, I would say waiting until January, because of the runoffs in Georgia, um, waiting until January made it impossible to make any type of real, true, educated guesses in December about things like capital gains tax or estate tax or uh, or income tax rates. Um, you know, there was uncertainty where in 2020, the required minimum distributions for some people were eliminated. In 2021, they're back, or are they? Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's extremely difficult to plan when things are changing in March or April in some years, retroactive to January 1. Yeah, uh, I think it was a lot of the waiting game, like you alluded to. Um, it was like we were waiting for a result. We were waiting for everything because you can't act until, you know, what we know what's going to happen. And then obviously that election came into this year with Georgia and, you know, we finally got some answers. But. We're still waiting on answers to see what actual fiscal policies and everything are implemented throughout this year, which I think those two bring us into 2021. And I'm going to ask you, go in your closet, go back to the office, dust off the old crystal ball, because we're going to be looking to the future here and uh, get started on this upcoming year. So I hope you're ready to go. You know, the but, problem um, with crystal balls is that um, when they break, you can't get parts for them. So my, mine's out of order. Enough. Yeah, I'll do my best. We broke that out of frustration a little bit ago. I remember I'll, that. That I'll was a good day in the office. Yeah, no, I'll do my best. <laughs> but uh, building back on of COVID in 2020, leading into 2021, um, hot topic, especially with the election, as we spoke about, is vaccinations and getting those vaccinations out and implemented into everyone and trying to get back to a sense of normalcy. Um, what are your expectations, not with pushing the vaccinations out, but What's to come once we do start seeing the recovery and, you know, companies and organizations uh, start to open up, we get back into the world where we're able to go to a happy hour together, you know, enjoy time with our coworkers or friends and being out and about in the world. You know, I wish I could tell you with some sense of clarity, but anything that I suggest here would be uh, opining uh, because 
I really don't know what's going to happen. I think there's going to be a swath of the population who get vaccinated and then immediately are re-released into the wild and can't wait to go doing all the things they were doing and go to the beach and go to the bar and go to the restaurants and visit with family and friends. And I also think there's going to be another group of the population who is a little bit hesitant, even with a vaccine, to um, to go back to whatever normal used to be. I think there's going to be people who flinch when you go to shake their hand for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think there's going to be a um, I, I, I think there's going to be some trepidation around that, unfortunately. Um, in terms of business, I think businesses are going to get back to a relative sense of normal very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think office space is going to change, and that's going to impact real estate, particularly commercial real estate. Um, I yeah. think now that people can work remotely in a lot of industries, you're going to see more population shifts. You know, it, just because you have a job in San Francisco doesn't mean you have to try and afford to live in San Francisco. You could live in mm-hmm. Provo. So that changes the game. Um, there's certainly some conversation about our offices even needed anymore. You know, are we going to need to have office space? And then for everyone who says we're not going to need office space anymore, office buildings are doomed. There's someone out there saying, hey, wait, um, not only is office space still important, but people are going to need more square feet per person. And you're not going to be able to do a cubicle mm. warehouse looking thing. So you're going to need more space. Yeah, there's there's it's, a lot of different diffi- sides to that story. It's difficult to know. It's difficult yeah, to know what's right. coming. Well, we're going to it'll definitely keep us on our toes, especially as an office, but just keeping an eye out for all clients and, you know, anybody out in the world who who doesn't know what it looks like, because the truth is nobody has that answer right now. If if we did, we'd be planning accordingly and nobody yeah. would have any of the questions. <laughs> I, I think it's never been more important to stay flexible because we, we really yeah. don't know what's going to happen. And we also don't know what is the efficacy of these vaccines? Does it protect you forever? Mm-hmm. Is it an annual thing that has to be developed? Does it protect you? But then mutations put us all back into this this state. And I, I think every time there's a new flu bug, there's going to be a tendency now to overreact and send everybody home for a few weeks. And that might be disruptive, too, to education and to thoroughfare and transportation and business. And I just none mm-hmm. of us know what's going to happen. Um, if I could get my vaccine while we were sitting here, I would do it because I'm enthusiastic mm-hmm. about about that. But um, you know, ultimately, it's going to take a long time to roll them out. Yeah. I mean, like you said, obviously, we're hopeful. But I mean, I guess it's one of the classic sayings of we'll know when we'll know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's waiting and, on that and, to come about. And then we'll react as best we're able. I mean, I, I don't know what yeah. else to say other than that there's going to be some there's going to be more change. That's the uh, ever present is is um, is the nuance and the change. And I think you hit the nail on the head with I mean, if there's one thing that COVID has presented us, it's the ability to be flexible. And it's going to be an ongoing process of tiptoeing on that line and reacting like we've talked about. But Yes, absolutely. To, to solve that issue, based on the election results that we finally got in the beginning of January, how is this election going to impact us um, based on moving forward with maybe future taxation or changes in taxes, which inevitably we're going to change but having an all blue um, presidency senate and everything how is that going to impact us kind of looking down the line with expectations we've heard of ideas that you know joe biden our new president has you know you raise a good point and that point mm-hmm. is that that with both houses of congress and the white house um, anytime they're controlled by a single party there is a little bit less resistance to types of policy change, and taxes are definitely one of them. Um, There's also the reality that when we have these giant stimulus packages happening, somebody's going to have to pay for this. At some point, we're going to pay the piper, and I don't think that's really blue or red. I think that is just a reality that um, when you borrow that much money, you are ultimately, and when you do that much stimulus, you're eventually going to have a, a bill to pay. So that's first. Um, in terms of the the, the Biden tax plan, um, mm-hmm. I, I think we're going to see um, dramatic tax change over the next two years, um, impacting primarily high earners, high income earners, 
Um, I, but I also don't think this is just at the federal level. I think we're going to see this at the state levels too, because states have to balance their budgets. They can't print money. You know, the mm -hmm. federal government can print money and say, look, we have plenty. Um, the states have to balance their budget. So we may feel more of a pinch at the state level um, in various places than we do federally. Um, I think certain taxes that tend to impact wealthier people disproportionately mm -hmm. are going to be low hanging fruit legislatively. So things like capital yeah. gains tax, things like estate tax, um, things like uh, Medicare surcharges and things that are um, net investment tax. Um, uh, mm -hmm. carryover basis changes, um, um, uh, 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 carried interest charges, which are being bantered about, about things like, you know, going after private equity and hedge funds and other types of, of tax structures. I, I, I think we're going to see higher taxation. I, I absolutely think that the ship sailed on uh, opportunities to do things like Roth conversions or speed up income into mm -hmm. 2020. And had we known the Georgia outcome, in November, we could have done a whole lot more of that, but not knowing made that a gamble that in most cases you just can't take. Yeah. And I mean, do you think we'll have a lot more answers sooner rather than later uh, in building into maybe future 2022 with looking to take advantage of current taxes? Or do you think those could be implemented, you know, quickly and take effect this year? I do think there'll be some things that take effect this year. Um, okay. My my fear is that some of them will be retroactive to January 1st. And mm -hmm. that's what makes this difficult. If legislation gets passed in April that starts three months before it gets passed by any party or any legislative body ever, that creates issues. Just like last year's CARES Act mm -hmm. created issues for required minimum distributions. And some people had to undo them and other people couldn't for various reasons. So markets like certainty over uncertainty in every case. And so even if, um, even if equity markets may not like the tax uh, policies that are being um, suggested, mm -hmm. the fact that we are likely to know the rules, it makes it a much easier game to play. You know, it, it's like if you open a Monopoly game and you just started rolling dice and moving around, but you didn't know how to play, you'd get pummeled by someone who knew the game. Mm -hmm. And the same thing's true on Wall Street, same thing's true on, on even Main Street. If we know the rules, we can abide by them and we can learn to navigate them. And so I, I think just having some clarity is gonna be helpful. Whether, whether we have a rooting interest for one party or the other or for one tax policy or the other, it's really immaterial. It, it's here now, this is what we're gonna mm -hmm. have. And now it's about uh, adjusting to it. Yeah. Um, you can't plan for something you don't know what you're planning for, <laughs> simply put. But speaking of those taxes and gains, um, I mean, it's been a crazy volatile year. And where where do you think some of these gains might be seen at moving forward? What sectors do you think we're gonna we're gonna find could be successful moving forward based on the way they're positioned right now? Uh, there are three that, that I feel pretty strongly about, and then there's mm -hmm. one real wild card. So I'll, I'll sort of give you okay. that one at the end. Um, the three that I feel pretty strongly about, one is financials, because, because again, there's going to be some certainty, and that tends to, to be good for financial mm -hmm. institutions. We're also likely to see interest rates return to some semblance of normal, which means they'll be yield okay. again. Um, and while that's not great for bondholders, um, and it's not great necessarily for borrowers, it's really good for lenders. And so financial institutions, especially those who are lending, are going to benefit from more normal rate curve. Um, so financials are one. Uh, healthcare is another. Healthcare is not going anywhere. And whether it's pharma or whether it's um, other types of um, medical devices, I mean, if one thing we learned in the last 12 months is that um, probably nothing's more important. I mean, you have healthcare and, and maybe food supply. Outside of that, I don't know what could possibly be more important on a day-to-day -day basis. And healthcare is not going anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Telehealth is not going to change the world. It might make certain things easier, but it's not gonna replace um, a, a visit to a doctor. You're, you're, you're not gonna be, I'm not doing my own root canal anytime soon, I hope. Um, and so I, I think healthcare is still gonna be, gonna be fine. And I think you're still gonna need physical space for it. And it, mm -hmm. the space will change. Um, you know, the, the third area, I think technology, technology is so omnipresent, I have a hard time calling it a sector anymore. You know, it used okay. to be that technology was a, 
was an industry. It was a field. And it's still, there are still companies that are considered tech stocks. But mm -hmm. the reality is if you are running a business of any type in the 21st century, you have technology, you have IT people, you have uh, hardware, mm -hmm. you have software, you have development, you have all these various pieces of it. And you have all of the different apps and all of the different, you know, 5G is going to change some things. And, and, um, and the next iteration of computers is going to change some things. And so I think technology is not going anywhere. I just don't know if it's a sector anymore. I think it's just part of business. Okay. Uh, and then I'll throw a wild card out at you, which is energy. Um, energy is an interesting one because there has been a, an enormous push towards green energy. And, um, yeah. you know, and, and not only green, sustainable, healthier energy options that, that are popular, not just amongst the public, um, but amongst various investors, I would say that um, big oil is not necessarily dead, mm -hmm. but it is going to have to shift. And I think if you see some of the big uh, oil companies figure out ways to go green um, at all, they have the incredible bandwidth to do an amazing job with it. They're massive. So if they decide that they're going to, to be involved with greener, more sustainable energies, they can win that game. They just have to decide it's important. And so I don't think we should give up on oil companies just because they're oil companies. I think they're going to be energy companies and oil will be a smaller and smaller piece of what they do. Um, but I think they may still exist and may still be in, in relatively good shape. It, the ones that, the ones that can pivot, you know, years ago, there was the, years ago, IBM had the opportunity to be where Apple is today. And in their infinite wisdom, IBM decided, what are people going to need computers for? There's no need for a personal computer. Computers are filling rooms there for that. IBM literally passed on what could have made them one of the biggest companies in the world. And Apple was like, watch this, hold my beer. And so what wound up happening is, it, it, you know, one big company failed to pivot and a, another mm -hmm. virtual startup um, took over. Look at Amazon. Amazon was an online bookstore. Now you can't do anything without at least checking it. They, mm -hmm. they've, they've managed everything. It's changed supply chain. It's changed warehousing. It's changed distribution. It's changed daily life. You know, it used to be you run out of laundry detergent and you're like, darn it, I got to get to the store. Now, by the time you hit start on the washer, you've got another one on the way. I was to say, same day shipping, waiting for so, it to show up at the door. <laughs> so the companies that are nimble and the industries that are nimble, I think are going to be doing great. The ones who are trying mm -hmm. to hold on to something that doesn't exist anymore are going to find themselves left behind. I think that's, I mean, I don't think I can put that better than you just did, but it's not only these small businesses that need to be flexible like we talked about earlier, it's these co entire organizations as a whole. And the ones that are able to are gonna be the ones who find success like Apple and Amazon have. But building off of what you just talked about, the financials and you know the expectation that you know, that could be a really good sector moving forward. You briefly touched on um, where current interest interest rates are at. Um, there's different ways to look at this. So I want to start off and talk about interest rates and their effects on savings right now. And kind of pick your brain about where you think interest, are at, interest rates are at in, in relation to savings and where you think those are going to go. And then we're going to come back and look at the borrowing aspect to kind of look at the other side of it. Interest rates have been so low for so long that, quite mm -hmm. frankly, we have at least one and possibly two entire generations that don't know any better. They don't remember anything different. And yes, I'm picking on you. Um, you, you know, when 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 the house I moved into in the early 80s with my folks was financed at like 16 percent, um, which is like buying a house on a on a MasterCard when you think about it or worse. Um, interest yeah. rates have been so low for so long, people have forgotten a little bit about what happens. And the problem is for savers, for people who were relying on money markets or savings accounts or short-term CDs or bonds or other things, the yield is so small, it's, it's a disincentive even to save money. 
you know, my daughter has a little account that she puts money into and, and we, we've taught her to be a good saver. And then she gets her statement and sees a penny of interest. And she's like, why am I doing this? And she's not wrong. It makes total sense. Like, go enjoy it. If she's you're asking only the right question on your account, she's asking the right question. So um, yep. for savers, um, low yields for this long have been especially bad. And um, and not just for savers, um, but also for lenders, because remember, when you're buying a bond, you're lending money to someone, whether it's a government or whether it's a business, you're lending money normally at a fixed rate, sometimes for a long time at an abnormally low rate, which means you're locking in awful, awful ROI. Um, in addition to that, bond prices, they, they, they react in an inverse way to interest rates. So if interest rates go up, bond prices drop. Well, if bond prices drop and yields are still lousy, that's a scary place to be. And that's considered the safe spot for a lot of people. And I put that in quotes. Yeah. So, you know, ultimately, I think for savers, having a more normal interest rate would be great eventually. But mm -hmm. for lenders, and particularly those lenders who are families who are buying bonds or whatever, they're going to feel some pain there first. Before it gets back to normal, there's going to be some pain. And so it's important to immunize your bond portfolio a little bit and 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 maybe work with your advisor to make sure that you're not mm -hmm. holding anything that's that's going to be too volatile when interest rates move. Now, in, in terms of um, in terms of a normal yield, I mean, mm -hmm. we, you know, I've been doing this almost 30 years, and I remember when the cash sweep fund in the brokerage accounts was paying five and a half, five and three quarters percent. Like that was a, a normal thing. Like cash was an asset class, not because you were afraid to, to part with it, but because it was making money. And I think that day will likely return. And that wasn't during a period of runaway inflation. Mm -hmm. That was a normal situation. Um, you know, runaway inflation was you can get a, a, a CD at 13%. Well, that's great, but your mortgage is 16%. So that was relative. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I know you wanted to sort of transition a little bit um, yeah. and, and the question on the screen still says sectors, but um, I know you wanted to transition Ooh, a little bit to, to, the, to the lending piece. Um, yes. But the borrowing piece, the borrowing piece is here. If you haven't refinanced your home and you're planning to stay put, do it before this call is over. Because quite frankly, this is the last shot. Now, mm -hmm. I recognize we've been saying that for several years. Eventually, we're going to be right. <laughs> So you know, all of us thought and interest rates had to move. They had to go up at some point, And that's still true. It's just been, mm -hmm. it just hasn't happened yet. So if you haven't done a refinance, now's the time. If you're contemplating anything that's going to involve borrowing money, now's a great time to borrow money. And it's always better to borrow money when you don't need it than it is when you do need it. When you need money, banks often won't lend it to you. So I think that's um, a good point. If you don't need the money, if you have a, a access to lines of credit, whether it's uh, on your home or on your securities portfolio, on your life insurance, on other things, this is a terrific time to make sure that that's set up. Um, mm -hmm. I would also say if you're borrowing right now, borrow at fixed rates because borrowing at, okay. at adjustable rates right now makes no sense. They will be higher and you're just, you, you're just playing, in, you're playing into the unknown there. Mm -hmm. To build off that, um, so let's say I'm looking to refinance and, you know, I'm presented the opportunity. Obviously, we can go a fixed 15 year portion or a fixed, a fixed 15 year mortgage and I can lock in like, let's say, 2% versus a 30 year fixed mortgage and, you know, higher twos. What do you think makes more sense? You know, one size never fits all. Uh, and, and for some people, <clears throat> doing the 30 year is going to be real important particularly if there's okay. other debt, if there are student loans, if there are, mm -hmm. um, if there's, uh, if there's going to be tuition on the horizon, if, um, if maybe you're not in your peak earning years, or maybe you have some concerns about your, your income stability, then having a lower payment for a longer period of time can be a very good thing. Now, if your income mm -hmm. is very stable, <clears throat> particularly if you're within that 15 years to hitting your financial independence mark, it's mm -hmm. reasonable to do a shorter term note, particularly right now when rates are where they are, just because there's there's a um, a sense for retirees who are debt free, there's an incredible weight lifted off of them. And, and that's not to suggest that all debt is bad debt. And if you have debt that's leveraged and you can afford it, no big deal. Mm -hmm. but 
but I would say for the most part, people who are trying to become financially independent are better off being debt free. And yeah. you know, so for younger people uh, and folks who maybe don't have as predictable a job situation, I still think 30 year makes a lot of sense. For people who are stable um, and who are upwardly mobile and who are really not as concerned about either only getting a cost of living adjustment or a, a job loss, then shortening that makes a ton of sense right now. Yeah, uh, I guess my thoughts kind of going into that question was, you know, based on the volatility and everything going on, but you already spoke about, you know, the stability and how the 15 year might make sense was, you know, a 30 year fix, I'm gonna have that lower payment for a lower period of time, where if something does happen, the bad thing happens, let's say your HVAC unit goes out, you know, you're in a better position and have more funds available um, with a 30 year fixed mortgage versus the 15 in order to kind of accommodate for that. And that's the volatility you just touched on. Cody, you're right. I mean, it, it comes down to wherewithal. Mm -hmm. What other resources yep. do you have? What would your plan B look like? Um, the last thing you want to do is, is take on a payment that's a stretch and then realize yeah. something's changed against you. It. And now you got a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that's awesome, but we're about to get into uh, a little bit of a new subject that I'm, I'm more excited about because everybody's favorite thing is to talk about work. So 2020 was crazy, but you know, some businesses and companies did really well, which resulted in raises or a bonus at the end of the year. And let's say you're put in a situation where you actually received that bonus or raise. What should those people be doing now? with those extra funds um, in comparison to what they were doing last year? I think at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it depends. Um, and, and it depends <laughs> on a lot of factors. If, if, you know, if you received a lump sum bonus, if you're fortunate enough to get one in December, mm -hmm. January, whatever it was, you know, for some people that is now gonna go to their emergency fund so that they can okay. have more cash to have a sleep at night balance. Mm -hmm. For some people, it might go toward extra excess debt reduction. Um, for some people, it might allow you to start contributing more to your retirement plan by parking that in cash and therefore accepting a smaller net check at the end of each two-week period or whatever because you have that, right. that bandwidth. Um, so for a bonus, you know, I rarely say, oh, take the bonus and drop it in your investment portfolio. Um, but depending on the size of it, a lot of times you either want a dollar cost average in over a period of time or you want to think thoughtfully about some of the other shorter term things. If you're contemplating a car or home improvements or other things that come along, if you have tuition for your kids, there's other ways to use a bonus. Now, in terms of a raise, raise is totally different because if, if you've gotten a, a two or three or 5% raise and you're in a position where you were already saving, say, 10% of your income, make sure you keep saving that 10% of your income, even though your income's gone up. It's important to keep okay. your spending from getting out of control. So if you're living on 90% of what you make, that's good. Make sure you continue to live on 90% of what you make. And 90 is not magic. It might be 73, it might be 80. But whatever it is that you're living on, um, when you get a raise, at least keep your percentage that's being saved, whether it's in your 401k or other things, at least level, if not higher. A lot of times it raises an opportunity before you get used to spending additional monies. It's an opportunity to increase your savings rate and make financial independence goal uh, easier to catch. Okay. Uh, I think you threw out a few terms there that maybe not all of our listeners are familiar with or know exactly what they should be. And to build on that, the idea of an emergency fund, what would you say would be a good idea for an emergency fund? for a single individual um, has a salary job versus, you know, a couple that's married down the line. Um, is there a certain number I should be hitting? Is there a certain number of months of salary I should be having in that account to live on? Uh, I, I think it'll be beneficial kind of to break down a couple of these terms um, for some of the listeners today. Sure. Um, an emergency fund really is just that. It, it is designed to make sure uh, you use the HVAC uh, example. It, it's to make okay. sure you're not you're not an HVAC unit or four tires away from from hanging from a credit line. You know, you you, you okay. want to make sure that there's dry powder. Now, it really has nothing to do with your salary. 
People confuse uh, an emergency fund based on how much they earn. It's not how much you earn, it's how much you spend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you earn $10,000 a month and you spend $2,000 a month in an emergency, you don't need $10,000 a month, you need $2,000 a month. So, and th that's an extreme sort of silly example, but, but I use it because um, it's important to know where you're going to get the money for, um, for a, a period uh, of unemployment or a period of underemployment. You know, mm -hmm. COVID taught a lot of people a lot of things about suddenly not being able to go to work, whether they were, you know, uh, bartenders or whether they were delivery people or whether they were office workers, whatever it was. Um, and so in a single income household, I typically want to see six months of expenses in cash. Okay. In a dual income household, in a two income household, that can be lower as long as the two incomes are relatively similar. So if, if a married couple, e each spouse makes $60,000 a year, um, the, the odds of them both being unemployed simultaneously are lower. So it is reasonable to think that an emergency fund only has to make up half of the spending because you'd still have one of the paychecks. Okay, so you have so some coverage. And, and I think that three to six months is, is fine. It doesn't necessarily all have to sit in a savings account. You can use a certificate or deposit or something that's got that's penalty free and gives you some flexibility, but don't risk the capital. Don't risk the principal. Mm -hmm. That's not money you invest. Um, and as you get um, as you get further along the spectrum of wealth, um, emergency funds have a double duty. They also start playing as opportunity funds, which means there's suddenly a chance to do something exciting or to participate in something exciting, and you have excess money prepared to do that. Uh, so I would say start with three to six months, but but allow for that flexibility to continue as you get into some different opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm laughing because I'm thinking about the opportunity cost and I'm thinking about, you know, when COVID does end, you know, all the things that I haven't been able to do that I want to do and I want to make sure I have the funds, uh, funds available to do that. So I got a good chuckle out of me, but the new year also brings a new opportunity for employee benefits. And there are a lot of people out there who whether they're early on in their careers, have no idea what employee benefits are, all they think about, which they're not wrong, you know, you have your employer and possibly an employer match of some kind, but there's a lot more to it than just that. So I was hoping you could touch on maybe those new to employee benefits and those that have changes in their employee benefits or what they should be doing this year. Uh, employee benefits have been changing so much over the last couple mm -hmm. of decades, and and that is that period of change is is where that pace of change is is actually uh, speeding up now. So, um, when when I think about employee benefits, the first thing I think about generally is health insurance, because okay. walking around without health insurance is is a a disaster waiting to happen a lot of the times. Now, health insurance has changed a lot over the years. It used to be that you signed up for a plan you paid a premium and the plan took care of almost all of your expenses. Mm -hmm. Today, a lot of those expenses are being passed back in the form of deductibles or co-payments or other things. And so you really need to look at your health plan options and figure out which one makes the most sense for you. I think that the, the advent of the health savings account, the HSA, is something so powerful that um, for people who are in a position to do it, having the lower premium option on their health care and then putting money into a health savings account that is tax deductible regardless of your income and then being able to grow that money tax deferred and potentially tax free for the rest of your life is the greatest tax accident ever. It is legal, it is smart and quite frankly one of the most powerful tools ever and people don't understand them they're kind of afraid of them um, and a lot of people just don't use them and don't elect them and so ask your financial advisor about them your HR department can't give you advice they're not allowed to give you advice they can hand you this 200 page packet and say here pick something we need it back on Wednesday I don't know about you but when I got my first one of those at 22 I was I was a deer in the headlights I had no idea what I was looking at um, I I think a lot of people listening just, you know, it, this is the first time they're hearing HSA, health savings account. And like you said, it's it's an opportunity for to put money away tax deferred, well, actually, hopefully tax free down the line, but tax deducted. And then down the line, what you're saying is we can actually use those funds tax free. So these funds that we're putting into it are never taxed. Correct. And as long as they're used for health care, 
at some point, they're never taxed, there's no look back. You can save money in an account for the next 10 years and even invest the money and hopefully grow the money over that period of time mm -hmm. and then file 10 years worth of medical claims and still have it be tax free. Keep your receipts. Spend your, your co-pays mm -hmm. and your little stuff out of pocket, keep a file of receipts. And if there's ever a day where you suddenly need 15 grand, go into your HSA, type in all the various receipts, send them off and voila, there it is and it's tax free. Big, that's a big, big deal. Um, beyond that, there's also retirement plans. So that's just healthcare. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think people make mistakes with retirement plans, first of all, because they under participate. Um, and you, you absolutely want to make sure you're taking advantage of whatever your employer is willing to contribute. And there are employers mm -hmm. who contribute to HSAs. There are employers who contribute to 401ks. Some of them are a match, some of them are some other formula. But to not accept, to not put enough money in to at least max the match is, is to give up an immediate free, free money, immediate raise. So mm -hmm. that's something you want to do. Um, beyond that, you really have to think about your tax picture and your earnings and whether you should mm -hmm. be in a traditional or a Roth account. Should you pay your taxes now and not later, or should you deduct now and pay taxes later? And that's unique for every family and, and individual and situation. So that's something to really think about and, and potentially meet with your advisor about. And then in terms of other benefits, uh, people overlook the disability benefits. Uh, a lot of companies pay for okay. short-term disability. That's great if you're out for 13 weeks. But the long-term disability is what if, you're, what if you're never going back to work? And some companies pay for it, but only pay for it up to a certain limit, and you can buy it up. And if you're young, typically, it costs next to nothing. But the, the biggest mm -hmm. asset you have, Cody, and I'm putting you on the spot here, but the biggest asset you have isn't your home. It isn't any mm -hmm. possession. It's your earning capacity over the next 40 plus years. So to not ensure the biggest okay. asset that you have at this stage of your life would be a dramatic mistake. It's more valuable than anything you own is your ability to earn. Mm -hmm. I think that's a perspective that a lot of people don't take into consideration when you know they're handed this employee benefit packet that would say a lot of people don't even read, but now's the time, the beginning of the year, the fresh ones are sent out. Take that time on a Saturday night when we're not allowed to go on the town or you know, go out to eat or anything like that to, you know, gain a better understanding of what your company is presenting to you as an opportunity for your future savings or the benefits they have to offer. Um, no better time than the present, I guess, would be a way you could put the employee benefits discussion. Put your um, annual enrollment, put it on your mm -hmm. calendar, put it in your, put it in the, the reminder uh, tickler for you. If, if this happens next November, be ready for it when November rolls around. Yep. Really think about it because a lot of times people, it's just one more box to check and oh yeah, do the same thing I did last year and to heck with it. There's money in there. There's, there's money in the form of matches or employer contributions or tax-free benefits or dollars and there's things you can't get on your own or not as favorably or not as inexpensively. So the fact that these things exist, um, they exist to help employees. They also exist, frankly, to help employers because employers who are smart understand that the financial wellness of their employees matters to the job that their employees are yeah. able to do. I mean, employees who are worried about making their next rent or mortgage payment are not focused on work. So that's why it's important to make sure that if you're a, a business owner, um, that you're not only paying more than just a living wage, but a, a thriving wage, um, and that you have the right benefits to take care of people because ultimately you want them being able to concentrate on work when they're at work. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. And, you know, the wellness of the employee is what really helps the organization grow and become what it wants to be. So let's say we have people listening, you know, they're making all these right decisions. They've gotten their raise, they're saving their 90%. Still, they're taking advantage of their employee benefits and they start to see their net in, or net worth, excuse me, increase. What are the steps that they need to take in order to protect that net worth and then continue to have it grow, which is the goal of almost everyone? I mean, all of us want to grow our net worth, right? That sounds fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although, although I would tell you that there comes a point where growing your net worth is less important than having some fun and enjoying it. So there, there is mm -hmm. something to be said for not being um, too miserly, like take the trip before you're too old to enjoy the trip that you can now afford. Um, but I digress. Um, in terms of what to do <laughs> as your net worth goes up, um, 
there are things you need to do to ensure that. Think of your net worth mm -hmm. as your castle. And okay. before you build this beautiful castle, the first thing you do is you build a moat. You dig a moat, you put in a, mm -hmm. a catapult, and you, you put in a drawbridge, and you protect your castle. Well, how is that done in modern times? You know, Because invaders are different now, hopefully, than they were in medieval times. So today, what are the invaders? Well, there's liability, there's lawsuits. Um, mm -hmm. the, the big things that really can, can clobber you are lawsuits, uh, divorces, um, uh, untimely, mm -hmm. any kind of untimely death. I don't know what that means. I don't know what a timely death is, but, but an unexpected <laughs> untimely death. Um, and so as your net worth goes up, it's important to protect yourself from those things. And the biggest one people forget, people understand what life insurance is generally, and they understand mm -hmm. that they insure their home and they insure their car. And, but what people forget is that the biggest risk most of us face is being sued. And generally that that's, mm -hmm. takes form in two different ways. One is personal and one is professional. So if you're in a profession where you need errors and omissions insurance or malpractice coverage or other things, protect your wherewithal that way. Um, and then for individuals and families, have a personal liability umbrella policy with your property and casualty company. It goes over mm -hmm. and above your home and your car. It's very inexpensive and it will protect you. If you get sued, you want your insurance company to care about the outcome financially. You don't want them to say, you okay. know what, this is really bad. I'm just writing a check for it and to heck with them. You want them on the okay. hook for enough money that they send their A team of attorneys to defend you. And that means have an umbrella that at ideally matches your net worth. It's sold in increments of a million dollars. They're not expensive. Okay. And unless you have teenagers or terrible driving records, they tend not to be terribly expensive. Um, and if you have teenagers with terrible driving records, just take the car. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the, the umbrella really is, is one of the steps people forget. And it's a big deal because a uh, lawsuit is, unfortunately, it's one of the biggest risks we all face. And a lot of your insurance companies where you get your car insurance, you're, you're saying they offer these umbrella policies so you can just call up your agent and, you know, oh, yeah. request a quote. Is that yeah, the process? They, they do offer them and they rarely encourage people to get them. When you call your insurance company, mm -hmm. most of the time, it's all about can we save money and what can we get done in 15 minutes? Um, there's more to it than that. And, um, okay. and I, I think a lot of times, unfortunately, insurance agents as a whole tend to be order takers instead of advice givers. So if you feel like you're calling and placing an order and saying, I want this, 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 and this, you better be darn sure you know what you're asking for. You know, if I was in Paris okay. and I was ordering off a French menu, I'd be in deep trouble. I don't speak a word of French. Um, you want somebody with you who speaks French who says, this is what you should order. I was about to say, I'd love to see you in that situation. Now, th this is a chance for your financial advisor or others to help make that call with you or coach you on what mm -hmm. to get. And so when you call your insurance company or you check out six insurance companies to try and then get a, a, a decent deal, you're at least kicking the tires, but you know what you're asking for and you're not missing you know, yeah. big blind spots. Okay. So we're finally, we're able to get that new net worth covered. You know, should I be doing anything with estate planning documents? Uh, speaking personally, I'm 26 years old. Should I have estate planning documents? I'm not married and I don't have kids, but you know, is it time Absolutely. for me to get that or do I wait? Um, the time to get them was your 18th birthday. So you're late. Good. I'm on top of it. Um, yeah, you're, you're really right there. Um, it, as soon as you're an adult legally, um, and not an adult from a Budweiser standpoint, but an adult from a from a voting and going to war standpoint. Um, it, it, once you're 18, your parents okay. no longer have any jurisdiction, any ability to either handle financial affairs for you or to even speak to doctors on your behalf. You know, in medical care, really? it's all about HIPAA. So once you, if you have children and when they turn 18, they need to get basic financial and medical powers of attorney done. It'll cost you next to nothing but it'll name the person who can speak to a doctor or a bank on your behalf if for one reason or another you can't. And you know, okay. people just don't think of that. There's so much more to estate planning than just, who gets all my wealth when I die? That's not what it's about. You know, that is just not what it's about. It, it, yes, mm -hmm. there's a will and yes, there's property, but especially for young people and then for young couples with young children, it's yeah. about who's gonna take care of my children or pets 
who's going to take care of the the financials who's going to take care of healthcare decisions these don't have to be complicated and they don't have to be expensive but they do have to be done by an attorney in your home state so wherever okay. you live if you're a resident of that state you should have those done and cody if you don't have yours done we're talking right after this you got to get them done <laughs> hey well, well we'll definitely reflect on uh you know the webinar after this and we'll have a few discussions but um no, just the idea of the estate plan, like these are some of the hard conversations, but they need to happen in order, you know, to protect yourself and your future family and, and everything along the way. Um, yeah, I, I mean, none of us know, none of us know what's coming down the pike. We don't know how long we're going to live. Yeah. We don't know how well we're going to live. We don't know when a, a diagnosis of cognitive impairment could come and change everything. We don't know when an accident could change mm -hmm. everything. Um, and that's morbid and it's no fun to think about, but yeah. it sure is better for the people who are left behind if they're armed with not only the knowledge of what to do and who to call and where to go, but also your wishes. They know what you wanted. It's so much easier than trying to then guess. And if you have yeah. four if you have four children, please don't name all four of your children to act together on something that important. They can't agree what mm -hmm. movie to see. They are not going to necessarily agree on where mom or dad needs to be for their later years. Name one person. And if you're concerned you're hurting your other kid's feelings, sit everybody down and say, we're naming your sister and here's why. And you can at least create a lack of surprise when the time comes. And then the yeah. kid you're, in, you're empowering with this, tell him or her, please talk to your siblings, consider their wishes, but ultimately you're mm -hmm. the decision maker. Gotcha. And we're getting a little short on time, so I want to move on to uh, you know one of the topics I was most excited for uh, for this webinar today because 2021 is is a year of age milestones. So we have a lot of things happening this year when you turn different ages, and I know you have a couple listed, but uh, I wanted to start off with you're turning 26 this year. What what are kind of the expectations of the milestones that are happening for you? Well, you're 26. Uh, the first step when you're 26 is you have to get your own health insurance. You should have your own car insurance. And for Pete's sake, get out of your mom's basement. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, that, that's not necessarily the biggest um, uh, milestone from a financial mm -hmm. standpoint, but it does matter from a healthcare standpoint. You can no longer be yeah. on your parents' health insurance. Yeah. Okay. Well, building off of that, if you were born in 1971, you're turning the ripe age of 50. What, uh, what are some of the things you can be doing this year? First of all, I was born in 1971, and you know that, and this is a low blow question. Um, yes, I am turning, I 50, I'm turning 50 this year. <laughs> the good news is if you're turning 50 this year, like yours truly, we now qualify for, um, for catch-ups, um, catch-up contributions on IRAs, on 401ks, on other types of retirement plans. So actually, you know, as of January 1st, even though my birthday is not till the end of the year, as of January 1st, I was able to start contributing with the catch-up contributions to my 401k right away. And that—that that is a significant thing. And um, it's one of the few good things about turning 50, that, and I think there's a discount on, on soft drinks at some fast food restaurants. <laughs> well, we're gonna have to go out and take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, building up on those, ca or building off of those catch-up provisions, uh, what happens at the age of 55? Is it something with HSA? Yeah, um, HSAs have different provisions than retirement plans. You don't get your catch up until you're 55. And interestingly enough with HSAs, you can't contribute once you're 65. So you have that 10 really? year window to contribute extra, but then you have to stop. You're not allowed to continue um, under most circumstances. So um, yeah, if you were born in 1966, this is a year to think about doing some extra things for your HSA. Okay, and uh, you know, building off of all of those, uh, like I said, we're running a little short on time, so I want to skip to the last two that we had on our list was uh, you're turning 70 and a half this year. What are some charitable ideas that you can do from your IRAs? 70 and a half used to be the magic number for required distributions where the, the IRS basically mm -hmm. said, we want our money. You've had it long enough with the tax break. Now we want to get paid. Um, that was changed last year to 72. But there's a provision in the law that allows um, that allows folks who are 70 and a half who want to make charitable gifts directly from their IRAs to do so up to $100,000 a year. That's wow. a very big deal because if your income tax bracket is 30 or 40% all in, anything you give to charity, 
you would be able to not pay those taxes on the IRA withdrawal, plus still take a charitable deduction. That's a very significant thing, and that still starts at 70 and a half. Now, the required minimum distributions, the RMDs, start at 72, but the Biden mm -hmm. administration and the current legislative, uh, legislative bodies are looking to change that potentially to 75, which is another reason okay. why we are not encouraging clients to do this yet this year, because we don't know whether that could happen this year or not. Um, but the age could be 75, and that's a really good thing. It's a good thing for tax planning. It's a good thing for longevity planning. You know, there, yeah. there, there, there are people who are living to 100 and 105 and 110, and it's real important to, to not run out of money, and part of that is not prematurely tapping certain kinds of accounts. Okay. I mean, this year we got a lot of people um, – looking to take advantage of these age milestones but uh this is a recorded webinar so we're going to have those listed uh if you have any questions we'll obviously be able to help in any way we can um the last point we had before we actually have a question from uh one of the listeners was you know what's the first step in kind of organizing 2021 for ourselves first step is inventory figure out where yep. you are any any journey you're going to take whether it's a, a simple trip or whether it's a bigger life journey you certainly want to begin with the end in mind. You want to know where you're going, but it's not enough just to know where you're going. You have to know where you are to figure out what the route is going to be. So take inventory, figure out okay. where all your accounts are, how they're titled, who are your beneficiaries, um, what are you putting away? Are there are there plans left over from prior employers? Are there pensions that you may need to elect on someday? What is all the stuff? Mm -hmm. I would say begin with that. Um, and talk to your financial advisor or call us at BFG. We'd love that. But um, there are yep. there are some free resources available that I'll, I'll plug now, Cody, with your blessing. Um, first thing is, um, if you go to financialplanningforall.com, uh, you will find some information on how financial planning is uh, available, accessible, and affordable. It's not only for mm -hmm. rich people. Um, and the same thing is true with estate planning. It's not only for the rich. Um, and the last thing is, you know, this year I, I published my third book, Don't Retire, Graduate, same name mm -hmm. as the podcast, shameless plug. This is the book. Um, there's a workbook coming and I would say um, go to Amazon. We've already talked about mm -hmm. them or wherever you buy books. Don't Retire, Graduate is a it's a blueprint for financial literacy and to get to financial independence. And it's a fun read. It's not boring at all. I promise. Yeah, no, I I thought your book was extremely beneficial when I read it and I work with you. So I'm sure anybody that gets their hands on it will uh, be able to pull some value from it. Um, last thing we got, we have a, we have one question. It's from Kimberly. Um, she was asking for a recommendation for some of the best resources or websites for obtaining student loans. Um, obtaining student loans? Yeah, uh, that was the verb she did use. Um, <laughs> You know, most of the time when student loans are going to happen, they are um, orchestrated or um, suggested by the colleges or universities where you're going to be going. Okay. And once you've done the FAFSA and you get into schools and you get your financial aid offer, then you figure out what the shortfall is and how much might need to be done by loan. Um, and then there are, uh, for, for folks at the low income range, there are Pell Grants. There's also Stafford loans, federally mm -hmm. subsidized loans. It's a, it is a very complicated thing. Um, but admissions offices right now across the country are desperate to get good students. Um, yep. There's an interesting shift happening where uh, supply and demand have changed. And now there is less demand and more supply and colleges are seeking students. Number one, that means mm -hmm. you can negotiate your financial aid package. Number two, it means you can tell them, I, I, I'm not coming unless I get the right kind of student loan package and so forth. Um, and lastly, I would just editorialize. If you can avoid okay. student loans at all costs, Kimberly, avoid them. Um, student loans are um, almost completely unnecessary. There are always less expensive uh, education options available. Um, and, um, you know, the folks we've seen, the Gen Zs, but especially the millennials yep. who are really saddled with massive loans, are starting their ascent, their wealth building in a hole instead of starting at zero. And, yep. and so while student loans may still be a reality, I think they're a shrinking reality. And I would urge you to do everything possible to minimize or eliminate them. I think that covers that. I mean, taking advantage of whatever you can at this time. But Eric, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Really appreciate you, uh, you know, joining me on this first webinar. It was exciting. We're a little nervous going in, but I think uh, 
I think we got through everything we wanted to. So thank you so much. Uh, everybody listening, thank you guys for tuning in. We're going to be doing these monthly. So please register for the next one where we'll be discussing marriage and uh, the process of combining your world with your future spouse. Uh, and we'll actually be having that conversation with another principal at BFG, Lena Neville. Uh, so once again, thank you. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time.